we'll uh, discuss uh, the last one in our uh, series of case studies, Digital Media Four. So uh, the one that we we'll discuss first is uh, based on Intel Networks Micro Architecture. It was the first one that Intel announced in uh, early 2000. It is a completely new architecture compared to Pentium 3. So in the class, we mentioned that Pentium 3 uses the P6 micro architecture. We discussed uh, in some detail. Um, so in Pentium 4, uh, trace caches were introduced. They replaced the conventional instruction cache. Um, it uses very high speed arithmetic units. Uh, often these are called uh, double pumped ANUs. So we discussed that. Um, so essentially, the, what this means is that if your processor runs at 3 gigahertz, the ANUs would operate at 6 gigahertz. They can compete in half a cycle. Netburst had 42 million transistors on a 217 millimeter square dial on 180 nanometer CMOS. So this is fairly advanced compared to your uh, mix R10K and R4264, which are in mid 90s. And the one that we'll be discussing now was codenamed Willamet. So Intel Pentium 4, uh, you may not know because uh, these things don't come, come out really in the market. So when you buy, you will buy a Pentium 4. Now Pentium 4 has several gradations. Uh, we'll discuss uh, three of these. The first one is Willamet. Uh, next, we'll discuss Markov, and the next one is Prescott. Um, so these three pretty much uh, show the, the, the new designs that were introduced as we go along. Prescott was the last one, actually. So Willamette consumes uh, 55 watt at 1.5 gigahertz, and it introduces a large number of new SIMV instructions and also SSC2 instructions. Uh, five stages. Um, so this is just a partial pipe. I'm just trying to show you how long it takes to uh, verify a branch prediction. So calculation of next instruction pointer takes two cycles. So so in Intel Lingo, uh, this is essentially the program count. Same as PC. Um, trace cache fetch takes two more cycles. Uh, you will occasionally find pipe stages named dry. So these five stages actually do not do anything. They only communicate from one part of the chip to another. Okay. So uh, this this happens more as you try to achieve higher frequency because what happens is that uh, wires do not get faster as you reduce transistor size. Transistors get faster, so you can do faster computation. But since wires do not scale as fast as that. Uh, your communication becomes more or less constant time. Okay. So as you try to scale at a higher frequency, what happens is that you find that suddenly you just cannot communicate from function unit A to function unit B and actually accomplish the task on unit B. So A has produced a result which you want to communicate to B and B has to compute something new. So you suddenly find that you, you, you cannot accommodate this communication and compute on B in a single cycle. So then you have to divide into two parts. One of the cycles will just be communication, nothing else. Okay, all right. So that's this particular stage. Then you allocate, allocated queues, allocate ROVs, etc. Uh, rename for two cycles. Um, then this one actually schedules the instruction queues. This one schedules finer grain micro op queues. We'll discuss that. Uh, that takes three cycles. And then finally, you dispatch microps to the function units. Uh, that takes two cycles. Register file read takes two more cycles. You execute. So these are these are the fastest possible execution that I'm showing here. Uh, there are instructions that take long. Okay. And after execution, uh, in Intel x86 ISA, uh, there is something called a flag register uh, that you have to update based on outcome of instruction. Okay. For example, uh, did I overflow my Addition operation. Okay. Uh, so there are many other flags that are mostly used by branch instructions to, 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 to decide whether the branch is taken or not. Okay. So you flag update and then you uh, decide whether which way a branch should go. Okay. And finally, the branch outcome is driven for one more cycle to the front end 
of the pipeline. So if you notify that you know whether there's a mistake or not. So if you count, you'll find that uh, starting from the beginning of the pipe to the time you get to know that the branch prediction was correct or wrong, it takes 20 seconds. So you can just add this up. It comes to 20. So it tells you that uh, there's a 20 cycle branch misprediction penalty. I predict a branch 20 cycles later, minimum 20 cycles later, I'll get to know whether I was correct or not. And uh, we'll soon get to know that every cycle, this particular processor fetches three x86 instructions. So 20 cycle lost with 60 lost instructions. You've essentially wasted 60 instructions in the pipeline, which is a huge, uh, which is a huge loss in performance. Okay. So the implication is that you need smart branch predictors, really, really smart, to fight this long branch inspiration penalty. Okay. So there's a block diagram of the microarchitecture. So there is a front-end branch target buffer, which has 4096 entries, which talks to the instruction TLB and the instruction prefetcher. Uh, so this one will be used only when you actually miss the trace cache. You do not find the instructions in the trace cache. Right? So we discussed how a trace cache actually works along that. Similarly, the trace cache is a branch target buffer as well. Okay. So since trace cache, in the trace cache, a cache line contains non-sequential instructions, may contain, okay, right? because there will be branches in between. And depending on the target that you have seen in the past, the trace will be built. Okay. So when you read from the trace cache, according to a trace, you have to verify whether the branches behave in the same way or not. Right? If they don't, then you have to discard the trace. That's the purpose of having this branch target buffer. You ask this BTP to tell, tell you what the branches, branch outcomes are that fall in the particular trace. And if they match exactly, then only you consume the trace. Otherwise, you discard the trace and go to the LP cache. There is no L1 instruction cache in this architecture. The trace cache provides uh, microps, which is why you see that the decoder is not in the path on, of the trace cache. It's actually before it. Okay. So only if you don't take from trace cache, then only you can decode. Otherwise, you don't have it. Trace cache gives you decoded microps, which directly go to the micro queue. Or if the instructions are fairly complicated, you can actually execute it from the microcoded uh, reloading memory. Right? The micro queue uh, sends instructions to allocator in the renamer. Uh, so what they do is that, of course, they rename instructions, which we have discussed already. And the allocator allocates the instructions into two different queues. One is a general purpose queue, which would contain integer and floating point operations. Other one is a memory micro queue, which would contain the memory operation. Okay. From these two queues, you send them to the respective scheduler queues. So, so these queues, these two queues are pretty large. But you need smaller queues so that you can actually compare your dependent instructions and figure out independent ones. So these two queues send instructions to what they call schedulers, scheduler queues. These are made very small. And here you can see that there are five schedulers. One is a memory operated schedule, which would schedule only from this queue. There are four schedulers here. One is a fast ALU scheduler. One is a slow ALU scheduler. One is a general floating point scheduler. One is a simple floating point schedule. Right. So what they do is that all of them, uh, send the instructions to the register file. So for example, floating point schedulers would send instructions to the floating point register file, while the others would send the instructions to the integer register file. Okay. And then you have several functional units here. As you can see on the floating point side, you have a floating point move unit and floating point MMX, SSC, and SSC2. On the integer side, you have two address generation units, which would compute the loads to addresses. And there are two double pumped AUs that that operate at the double frequency of the processor. And there's a slow AU, which executes complex instructions and operate at the same frequency as the processor. Okay. Memory operations continue after this particular address computation to L1 data cache. And if they miss here, they will go to the L2 cache. And if they miss here, they would go to the bus unit to the system. Okay. So that's the rough uh, microarchitecture. Um, also, you can see that there is a direct path from L2 cache to the instruction TLB and instruction prefetcher. Okay. The reason for this is that if you don't 
Hitting trace cache, you have to go to the two cache to access instructions. There is no LO instruction cache. Okay. So what is the difference between uh, general SP scheduler and some SP? Yeah, we'll discuss that. Yeah. We'll see what instructions go to each other. Is there any question about this general front end? So let's start with the front end. Uh, so here I'll of course not try to uh, go stage by stage because that will take a long time. There are many stages. Right? 20 after branch uh, in a verification. There are many more after that. So I just club them together in terms of functionality, what they actually do. So front end includes a trace cache, a trace predictor, a decoder, and instruction TLP, a branch predictor, a branch target buffer, a return address stack, a microcode draw, and a micro queue. So uh, decoded micro ops are fetched from a trace cache of capacity uh, 12k micro ops. And all of them may not be distributed. We have discussed already about that. The trace caches may have duplications. Each trace cache line contains six microps, but can fetch only three at a time. Trace cache uses a trace predictor, which is essentially a branch target buffer working with the trace cache to carry out branch predictions. So the sole purpose of this is that when you are consuming a trace, it might contain several branches. You have to know whether the branches are going to behave in the same way or not. Uh, also, it consults a 16 entry RAS on return instructions. On a trace cache base, the ITLB is accessed to generate a physical address for accessing the entry cache. While fetching from L2, a bigger BTB with a branch predictor is used. Uh, and it's, it has a similar organization as the P6 microarchitecture, which we have discussed. Uh, so, uh, why L2 should have a BTB? You should imagine your L2 cache as the L1 instruction cache. Okay, then you can see that why you need a BTB. Because it's just as if this is your first level of instruction cache for where you're fetching. Okay, so you get you'll, you'll have to know what my next instruction pointer is going to be. Okay, that's the purpose of this BTB. Right? So this is the reason why you had a BTB in the fetcher. But these two BTBs are managed differently. Uh, this one and the trace predictor. So how do you handle trace cache base? Um, as the IA32 instructions are fetched from L2 cache. They are decoded into simple risk microps. So we're talking about this particular part here. So you miss the trace cache, so, so you're going through this. Okay, all right. So you bring something from trace cache, um, goes to a decoder, and then put in the trace cache. Right? So a decoder can handle IA32 instructions that can be transmitted with at most four microps. Okay. More complicated instructions are executed from microcode ROM. Um, so this one also we discussed earlier when talking about the Pentium Pro architecture. It's uh, going to last it the decoder. On a front end BTB miss, static prediction is used to guide the L2 fetch. And what the static prediction? It says uh, for not taking back or taking. So this one also we discussed in the class. As the instructions are decoded, they're placed in a micro queue. The trace gets built dynamically as and when branches are verified. As soon as a trace length reaches six, it is sent to trace cache for it because a trace cache line contains six microbes. The trace cache instruction pointer and L2 cache uh, instruction pointer are managed differently. So there are two different instruction pointers. Okay. Uh, once this is done, we move on to the allocator and the renamer. Uh, the allocator consumes three microbes every cycle from a FIFO microbe queue, allocates an ROV entry out of 126 entries. So why is it 126? Because does anybody have an answer? Because you want something that is divisible by three because you are allocating three every cycle. So that you can uh, bank it, uh, you can now organize, organize it to have three banks, uh, 42 entries each. Um, allocates necessary physical registers out of 128 entry, and 14.5. Why is it 128? Because it has to be a power of two. Um, allocates one entry, either general purpose queue or memory operation queue, both queues are people. Allocates a load queue entry for a load. Uh, load queue has 48 entries. Allocates a store queue entry for a store. Store queue has 24 entries. The renamer renames three microps every cycle, maintains an eight entry register alias table for uh, these eight registers uh, for x86. Um, writes the renamed instructions into general purpose queue or memory queue. Yeah. 
So the next stage is uh, micro scheduling, which consumes instructions from general purpose and memory of queue and sends them to respective schedulers. Uh, there are five schedulers for different types of instructions, each with eight to 12 entry collapsible issue queue. Um, each scheduler handles different types of instructions. We have already mentioned about this. Fast AMU, slow AMU, simple AMU, slow AMU, and memory. Okay. The schedulers work under three constraints, availability of operands, availability of issue ports, and availability of function limits. So there are four issue ports in Intel Pentium 4. Port 0 is shared between fast AMU and floating point move, store, and floating point exchange. Okay. So uh, you can see what the fast AMU does. It, it carries out add, subtract, logic operations. Uh, it computes the store data and branch operations. Okay. Port 1 is shared between fast AMU and slow AP. So there are two fast AMUs. Right? Uh, slow AP does SSC and MMX. Uh, port 2 is for uh, load, and port 3 is for store. Okay. So, so these are the four ports that we're talking about. So here they're shown actually. So this is uh, these are ports two and three. Yeah, these two, and here you can see uh, the other three other other three ports. Um, sorry, other two ports. So so there are ports that are shared between. Uh, so you can see that this is one port and this is another port. So what's the implication of sharing issue ports? So the question is, of course, we we. Could have designed the processor so that um, you have dedicated dedicated issue ports. So again, I mean, we, we discussed it a little bit earlier also why you might want to share, for example, register file ports. Last time we discussed that. The reason is that some instructions. So these are very common, but these are often not so common. So you can you can assume that most of the time the fast LU will actually get the port okay, whenever it needs it. Okay. Similarly here. These are not very common instructions, but these are common instructions, the fast ALU instructions. Also, the slow ALU instructions are not that common, but uh, shift and rotate are actually common. Okay. But most of the time, you can assume that the fast ALU will get the board. Okay. And load and store are given dedicated ports. Uh, the reason for this is very interesting, that um, you find that memory operations are always given, uh, most of the time, are given fast lanes. For uh, in x86 architecture, because x86 has very small number of registers. Those who have done a compiler course might understand that if you have small register number of registers, you'll have a lot of load store operations in your, in, your, in your program because the compiler will run out of registers. You, you spill data on the memory and then again store it back. So, so what is exchange? Floating point exchange. Exchange is a floating point register with top of the floating points. Um, but um, it's not an atomic operation. It's just a floating point exchange. So fast ALU can receive an instruction on every edge from either port 0 or port 1. Okay? Because both the ports are connected to fast ALU. The slow ALU can receive one instruction from port 1 every cycle. The slow FP and simple floating point units can receive one instruction each from port 0 or port 1. At most, one load and one store can be fed to the cache every cycle because uh, uh, they get only uh, one port each. Issued instructions proceed to read operands from register file, which may get overridden by a bypass. So uh, how many read-write ports in integer files? We can compute that based on these particular uh, you know, uh, issue requirements. Similarly, we can compute that for 14.5. And uh, Pentium 4 had a multi-cycle pipeline bypass network. So although you have designed bypass networks, you haven't pipelined those. You have assumed that you can bypass values from one stage to another in a single cycle. Right? As you go toward high frequency, this may not be possible anymore. So what you may, what you may have to do is that on a destination stage, of course, it's just a bunch of wires going to input of multiplex. That's your bypass path. Right? We have to put latches in here. Because the wires, I mean, it just takes time to communicate from here to there, okay, which may not happen in the single side. Okay. So we have to pipeline the bypass path so that, so let's suppose this is my destination pipeline register. So I have to bypass from here to here, let's say. Okay. Right. And this length of the wire is so long that you cannot do it in a single cycle. 
Okay, right? So what are the options now we have? Well, you can say that this value will be held for several cycles, and during those cycles, this register cannot generate any more bypass values. I mean, otherwise, the value will get cut eventually. Okay, right? The other option is that you can put latches in between. So you segment the WAN so that this can be done in a single cycle. Okay, right? So then while the first packet of value is here, in this particular segment, you can generate new values on the, on the bypass okay. So that was a key uh, requirement to, to meet the high performance. Otherwise, it was almost impossible to have high performance in this process. Fast ADU bypass is carefully designed to operate in half cycle. So the next slide, we look at the, the ADUs. So there are two double pumped ALUs, uh, produces results in half cycle. So how they do that? A fast adder acts on low 16 bits in quarter of a cycle, which is basically the half cycle of ALU clock. Uh, and is fed to the upper half forward of ALU, as well as bypassed to the lower half forward of ALU for dependence. Okay, all right. uh, processes upper 16 bits in the next quarter cycle and updates flag in the next quarter. So essentially what happens is that in half a cycle you're done with the operation, but the flags are not yet updated. So the flag update requires another one quarter of cycle. Okay. So this staggered address is sufficient for beginning of a cache tag hookup because uh, this is also used by um, the address generation unit. And the, for the index part, uh, the, the index part of the cache falls within the last, the least significant 16 bits. That's how they actually size the one cache. Okay, so that the, 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 the first ALU is enough for generating the cache index. Okay. The upper parts of the address will be needed for the ALU transmission model. So the ALU loop should just take over the 16-bit address and its input masses. That's basically enough. Um, so um, pictorially, this is what it looks like. So this is the the first ALU, which operates on the on the lower 16 bits, and see that it's bypassed immediately here, so that it can start operating on the next operation's lower 16 bits. Okay. Also, uh, it is sent to the to the next ALU uh, to operate on the higher 16 bits, so the carry bit has to be set right? uh, for for the for the for adding up the next 16 bits, uh, and then the output updates the flags. So this is basically the carry out, okay. which signifies an overflow or whatever, okay. overflow or an extra borrow, whatever way you want to do. The barrel shifter uh, is a four cycle uh, one. Uh, there is a 14 cycle multiply and there is a 60 cycle divide. And uh, of course, there are MMX and SSU. So these are basically the functional limits that you have. Okay. The cache island has a small and fast L1 data cache. Load access latency is critical for IA32. As I've just mentioned, uh, Intel architectures uh, pay special attention to memory operations. Obviously, okay. um, so the L1 data cache is 8 kilobyte, 4 way, as I said, 64 bytes and write through. Uh, virtually indexed, physically tagged. Integer load latency is 2 cycles, and floating point loads take 6 cycles. Okay. Um, load hits speculation for dependence, as we've discussed for R10K and R10K 164, uh, with the help of a predictor based on partial address match. Um, in case of miss, we execute all the dependence. So here, uh, unlike uh, the other architectures, they actually do not uh, start a refresh. They only re-execute the dependence. And here, uh, how they do it is that they have an estimate of the upper bound of the number of dependents. Okay? Because you can exactly calculate uh, the number of cycles that you take to know the exact outcome of the, of the, uh, of the hit. Of the, of the cache it. And within those cycles, how many dependents can issue? That you can also calculate from your issue constraints, okay, the number one. And they actually maintain a buffer of that size where they dynamically remember who are the dependents for each of the nodes that are currently inside the pipeline. Okay. There is a four entry LOL MSHR. Uh, we have discussed the purpose of this particular uh, structure in the class. Um, Store to load forwarding is allowed if the store address matches the load address and load size is less than the store size. So this one is a little conservative because this rules out the following case. Uh, so suppose I have a load instruction which 
loads these bytes. Um, and I have a store instruction which stores these bytes. So this is the store. And these are loaded. And this is my program order. So the store comes before the load. Right? So in this case, the load can actually take the value from the store completely. Because the load is contained completely in the store. But that's disallowed. What they want is that the starting addresses must be aligned and the load size must be less than the store size. So this is only a subset of what you could do. Beyond L1 cache, we have uh, 256 kilobyte, 8 way, 128 byte line size, right back into cache, 7 cycle round trip and um, frequency. It has a multi stream hardware architecture, identifies up to 8 independent streams using simple pattern based predictors. So, mostly strike predictors, which try to uh, pick up arithmetic progressions in addresses. Uh, Prefecture stays 2 cache lines ahead of the current request, interfaces to 100 megahertz quad pump 64 with system bus that connects to the memory. Any question? So we move on to the next one uh, after we lament. So what is the code from bus? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So, um, so it actually maintains four different clocks at four different phases, and on each for for every age of each of the phased clocks, you can transfer 64 uh, bits. So essentially, it has an effective frequency of 400 megahertz. Why is it same with processor clock? Sorry? There is no same with processor clock and processor clock. Uh, there would, yeah, there would be synchronizer at the interface. There would be, so synchronizer is actually buffers. So essentially what will happen is that from this side you have fast requests coming in, right? There will be a buffer which would actually allow you to have a slow interface on this side. So, um, so this one, uh, Willamette was 180 nanometer. Um, so in between there was uh, Northwood, which was 130 nanometer transistor, uh, 55 million transistors on 146 millimeter square die. Uh, the only thing that they changed from Willamette to Northwood was they doubled the size of the engine cache. We went from two kilobytes to five kilobytes. That's it. The next one was more interesting, and that's what we're going to discuss. That is the 90 nanometer Pentium 4. Uh, that's the Prescott code. And this one was actually the last one in the, in the Pentium family. Okay. Um, so this came after Northwood. And it redefined the concept of deep pipeline. Um, this is the first processor designed in the industry with 90 nanometer CMOS process. Um, Few mic micro architectural enhancements over original networks, so this is what we will discuss. It had 125 million transistors, so you can see that more than double compared to Northwood. Okay. So, must have done something on a smaller die, uh, 112 millimeter square. Um, store buffer size is increased to 32, uh, which was 24 earlier. A lower data cache size was doubled to 16 kilobyte and was also made eight ways with our um, it has a 31 cycle branch memory. From 20, it goes to 31. Okay. So it really had a very deep pipeline. Uh, the first uh, version of Prescott that came out had 2.8 gigahertz plus frequency, and uh, it was projected to have 4 gigahertz by the end of 2004, but Intel could not achieve it because of power problems. So it has stopped at 3.8 gigahertz, and this is what you can buy in the market in the name of Intel Pentium 4 Extreme Edition. So that's Intel Pentium 4. Prescott uh, clocked at 3.8 gigahertz. You can go and read up this one. Um, I don't know if it's still available, though. It's, a, it's an old link. Uh, you can read the story why it had to kill the 4 gigahertz Pentium. So this was uh, the termination of the Pentium line. Um, and we'll discuss what happened after that, of course. Um, but first, let's try to understand what these enhancements are. Okay. In, um, let's talk. So they optimize the store to load forwarding. Um, um, so they found that it's impossible to have 
a complete address match between a load with all stores, okay, which is needed uh, for two purposes, right? Um, so if you imagine a single queue of load and store of instructions, So let's look at a load here, right? Uh, which has a bunch of stores before it, bunch of stores after it, all right? So uh, you need to care about the stores before you because you may have a match with the address. So you may have to get the data from here on the stores instead of the cache. That's what we have discussed there, all right? You may have to care about um, um, yeah, fine. So, so loads will have to care about the stores uh, stores uh, uh, before it uh, for this, this reason. And the stores may have to care about loads after it okay. for a symmetric reason. All right? So when a store issues, it has to make sure that there is no load which has got a wrong path. All right? So now the, the fundamental question here is that when you're issuing a load, whether you should get the value from a store, or it should wait, or it can get the value from the load data. It can get the value from a store if the store has already executed and there is an address match. It must wait if there is rarely an address match, you don't know. All right? and, it, and it can go if you know for sure that there is no address match and the data can be taken from the remote cache. Okay. So for all these things, the, the fundamental element that you require here is a match of address. That is, once you compute the address to the load, you have to compare this address with all the store addresses here. All right? And uh, Prescott found that, since they are targeting very high frequency, that they just cannot accommodate a full address match within their cycle. So you cannot, uh, cannot compare a 32 bit address of the load with a 32 bit address here. Okay, that's impossible. So what they said was that, well, we'll be happy with a partial address match. Okay. So you pick up lower few bits um, and just do the address match. Um, so the, the main point here was that the time constraint because store forwarding logic must not have higher latency than the L1 data cache. So it should not be that. Um, of course, you would look up the L1 data cache in parallel with doing this, but this should not become the problem. So L1 data cache latency and this ideally should match, and this this one should be smaller in latency. Should not be bigger. Right? However, they found that if we get the full address match. The latency of this particular match was actually exceeding the known data cache we got okay. So they speculated based on partial address comparison. So if the, if, the, if the partial address comparison matches, they say, well, the node should take a value from the store, which may be wrong, actually. Right? And the other side could also be wrong. That if the, if the partial addresses don't match, they conclude that the, well, the load is safe to go and access the known data cache, which would also be wrong. So um, you initiate uh, a full address comparison. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. So if the, if the partial addresses don't match, then of course you're, you're, you're sure that there cannot be a, there cannot be a match. Okay. Uh, so initiate a full address comparison also and overwrite the previous comparison outcome if needed. So, um, so if, if, if there, is, there is an over, overwrite, that means the load and dependence must be executed to outcome here. Uh, they added new logic to forward bytes contained fully in a stored data, uh, even if the address is misaligned. So essentially, they finally addressed this particular case. What they did was that uh, they would they would actually do a do a rotate of the load so that uh, they first align the addresses. Okay, so in this case, essentially, what would happen is that the load should get these bytes only. Okay, so so they would actually shift the stored stored data to this side. And take because see the circuitry is such that it can only take the, the first few bytes. Okay, so the circuitry may not change from from your previous generation. That is, will it, which will allow you to take only the leading bytes of the store. Okay, so here they kept that unchanged. But what they did was that they actually shifted this store data by a, by whatever amount they want, so that you can still continue to take this data. But now this will become this will come here. So that requires a shifter. Okay. The other case that is uh, here, we are talking about the, the situation that uh, the load. So that there, there could be two possible effects of this misspeculation. One is that 
the load could have consumed the wrong data from a store because of a wrong partial address match. Okay. The other could be that um, the load consumed the wrong value from the LO data cache because there was a store which was actually which could not compute the address yet, but the load bypassed it. Right? Because the, what the load is doing here is that it will only pick up the stores from this side which have already computed address. Okay. There could be stores which are which haven't been executed. Right? So, uh, so in both cases there will be a re-execution uh, of the load and the dependence. Okay. Now, it has a static branch predictor. Um, so how is the other case detected? The store is not executed. Yes, for the store issue, it, it uh, checks all the so loads behind it. So, um, so, so recall that um, when you uh, miss the PTD, the element was using a static branch predictor, which was followed or taken back or taken. Uh, yeah, so not through band with element, both. So the observation that they made was that not all backward branches are loop branches, and hence may not always be taken. So um, I should mention here that these are actually not very frequent cases. Uh, these are mostly go tos and other cases where a compiler might be op optimizing certain pieces of code and generating a, uh, a backward branch which is not a loop branch. All right. uh, so Prescott team did a study and found that there is a threshold distance between backward branch and its target below which it's a loop branch. So what it says is that if you um, if you take the distance between the target and the branch instruction, if it is larger than a threshold, it's unlikely to be a loop branch, okay. which means the loop was a normal state. So uh, what they concluded was that you predict only those backward branches as taken that have target distance below this predetermined threshold. So this threshold was actually hardwired inside the processor. Uh, this was not really dynamic threshold. Okay. Also, the team observed that there is a correlation between condition type of a backward branch and its behavior. Backward branches with certain conditions are almost always not taken. Okay. So, um, so on a BTV miss, you could just fall through in these cases. So th this entire thing is a static prediction. There is no dynamism here. All you do is you do a you know analysis of your benchmarks, fix up a threshold, which which uh, separates these two sites uh, you know ma maximally, uh, and then you look at these conditions. You decide statically which conditions should be tagged with loop branches and which should not be, and then you hardware that and do a static prediction. That's it. Is that there is no dynamic learning going on. All right. So then it enhances the dynamic predictor also, uh, and particularly for index branches. Uh, in this case, because BTB is not good enough, uh, you must have seen it in your homework. Uh, so the observation was that data dependent index branches have targets correlated with global path history leading to that branch. So you've already implemented one such uh, predictor in your homework, and uh, Hopefully, you have seen that your normal BTB is worse compared to this particular predictor. Okay. So this idea was borrowed from the Pentium M team, uh, which was part of the Centrino chipset uh, team. Uh, in addition to a conventional BTB, uh, essentially they had a table of targets tagged with global history. Okay. Uh, the global history direct branch predictor gets priority over the traditional BTB. Uh, some more microarchitecture enhancements. XOR is often used to load a zero value in a register, uh, especially if you do not have a hardware to zero register like in x86. So uh, you typically come across this kind of code in x86 where you're essentially loading a zero in the X. Okay, all right? And EBX is just serving as some register here. Okay, it could be anything else. Okay, all right? The problem is that consider an instruction that produced EBX before it. Okay, all right? So there could be an instruction which produced EBX. There could be a bunch of instructions that con consume EBX. This instruction is also appearing to consume EBX, but that's not actually true. It has nothing to do with the value in EBX. Okay. So um, it introduces an unnecessary dependence between previous producer of EBX and this instruction. Okay. The point here is that this instruction will probably be held up until the instruction producing EBX has executed, okay. which doesn't make any sense. This is actually a dependent instruction. Okay. Right. 
So why would compiler generate such uh, so it can't why can't it just should it just use EAX, EAX, EAX? Same problem with it, sir. Yes, to yeah. And whatever else you yeah. use, you are you are setting up a dependency in use. So um, the Northwood scheduler could actually detect all these situations and ignore the dependence. So the logic was very simple. Uh, they had a table of such opcodes, which could be problematic. And uh, you just look at the opcode of the instructions, copy it as a table, and make sure that the both sources are same. Okay. And then what you do is you let it go instead of holding it up. The press card expands the set of such instructions. So Excel 6 has many more such instructions, okay, where uh, we could do such interesting things, where there's no dependence as such. Okay. Um, the Northwood also used the floating point multiplier for doing integer multiplication. Um, and this had an overhead of moving integer sources to floating point data path and back, which was saved in 2064 divided. Uh, so last time we discussed about this, we said that uh, 264 uses the floating point divider for doing integer division. So Prescott implements a dedicated integer multiplier. Okay. Some more enhancements. Uh, the general purpose and memory of queues are made longer. Scheduler queues are made bigger to get larger selection window. 30 new SSE 3 instructions, a 2 cache is increased to 1 megabyte. Uh, enhanced software prepage. Not to used to cancel software prepages that caused PTL releases. Prescott just continues with this. Um, enhanced hardware prefecture, 8 entry LO on MSHR, concurrent multiple page table walks needed for hyper threading, which we'll probably discuss next week. Okay. Alright, let me read on what happened after that. So, once the Pentium line uh, got terminated, Intel uh, essentially took their Pentium M code, which was designed for mobile devices, and uh, improved it to be used in their desktop, um, server, and notebook market. And this was called, the, the improved architecture was called a core micro architecture, based on which um, you have all your processors starting from core duo down to today, the core i7 and everything. Okay. That used this basic micro architecture. As such, nothing much changed, cannot change, because fundamentally it's still an out of order issue processor. Um, some numbers changed. Um, Fetch retirement width increased from 3 to 4. So now that matches uh, LIPS RTK and Alpha 264. Um, the pipeline was made shallower to save energy. Okay. So uh, Prescott had a 31 plus uh, stage pipeline. So it has a much smaller pipeline actually. Okay. Uh, they also introduced something called micro fusion. This was very interesting. So what they did was that. So they had actually two types of fusion, macro op and micro op fusion. So macro of fusion actually takes multiple x86 instructions and fuses them into a single operation yeah. at runtime. So this is done totally in hardware. And micro of fusion, what it does is that it takes the micro ops of an instruction and fuses them to, to reduce the number of micro ops in, inside the pipeline. Okay. So, um, so that, that actually saved a lot of uh, energy uh, and also saved execution time. Enhanced rounding mode control in floating point pipes. So actually, uh, well, I should say that this was actually done because they did not want to change their decoder. Okay. Because they could actually could have enhanced the decoder to actually not generate so many extra extraneous microbes. Okay. So after the decoder, they put this optimizer, who should actually examine the microbes and fuse them if possible. Okay. They had an enhanced rounding mode control in floating point pipe, faster integer division on average. Uh, so these two are very interesting. Uh, that actually probably gave uh, uh, a very high performance boost in their processors. Uh, early detection of problem loads. Uh, so this one uh, is, is talking about uh, loads that bypass store and later uh, get caught because that was a mistake. Okay. Uh, so I've seen in 2064 that they use a load weight table to, to remember such loads, okay, right? which has caused problems in the past. So the core microarchitecture actually uh, incorporates one such predictor, uh, a similar such predictor, which uh, tries to identify the loads that continuously cause such problems. Okay. They do not actually issue them speculatively. They wait until all the stores before it has completed. 
They also uh, incorporated an ALO1 data cache prefecture, which is instruction pointer directed. So this one is very interesting. What they observed was that, well, actually, uh, this, this has already been observed in several research papers, that if you take a program and look at a particular load instruction, you'll find that the data addresses that the load instruction generates are highly correlated. They will probably be sequential if you're accessing an array. So I'm, what I'm talking about is that so this one will be broken down into a load and a store and interpassed with an additional version. Right? So if you look at the addresses that this load instruction generates, they're going to be all sequential. Right? So and this is just one instruction that you are monitoring. Okay. So that's fairly easy to prevent. That's exactly what they did. They essentially made a table where for each load store instructions, uh, instructions address, there will be a prefecture which would actually find out this particular pattern. In this case, the pattern is sequential. Stride one and predictor. Right? So the advantage of an instruction pointer directed prefecture over an address-based prefecture is that it, it gives you a lot of compressed information. Just for a single program counter, you completely compress the, the whole pattern. Instead of actually looking at um, dividing it into a, into a bunch of streams and learning each of the streams separately. Okay. That's not needed yet. Which, which was, so those stream prefectures are still there because those are needed for catching other complicated patterns. But this one can catch simple patterns uh, and can work fairly well um, with a very small storage 